I'm guessing that in the next hour or so, we need to get around to this. Must big tech, fang tech, be regulated for the betterment of democracy, of mental health, of privacy, perhaps, of free speech, of overall shared economic wealth, true equality, the betterment of our souls as citizens, or simply just our souls? And if so, how? Who is harming who? How can the net be both pernicious and dangerous while also empowering and connecting? Is it truly a tool for citizenship? Uh, but, human yeah. to human. Yeah like, yeah, like the way I am in person, I'm a lot more comfortable in person than I am online. Okay. And so I feel that there's some artifice with me online and okay. I find that uncomfortable. Because I think sort of, I think your take is interesting. I don't actually think we have to behave online like we do in real life because I think they're different spaces. So when you get death threats and things like that online, that teaches you that those aren't really spaces. You know, I, no one has ever threatened my life in person, but they seem very comfortable to do that when it's anonymous and online. Right. So to me, that dictates my approach to those spaces. Even if we look at the title of this talk, Online, Offline, 10 years ago, we had the privilege of talking about online versus offline. You know, 10 years ago, it was like the matrix. You put on your headset and you logged in and you went through the tubes and the tunnels and you were in this digital world. You dial up. Whereas now we have these devices in our pockets, which are going to get smaller and uh, more convenient. Everything is going to get more and more sticky and addictive, but we're never offline. You know, just because I don't have my phone in front of my face doesn't mean I'm offline. People can reach me. I can connect. Those uh, modes of, of, uh, of connecting are always are always on and so I think that that's really the big change when I think about the last 10 years is just now there's other discussions I think that we need to start having about um, etiquette and uh, just attention spans and you know how we spend our time when we're not physically in front of our device but I would argue that we're still all completely online right now. Before I felt uh, it was um, it was a tool uh, to improve what I was doing it was like really giving me superpowers to do it better and now I think that is the kryptonite, like draining my superpower, mm -hmm. draining my focus, and, and draining my ability to separate the spaces uh, to think. Interesting. And Bianca, early days, digital commons. For real, it was good, it was opportunity, it was... Oh, we are idiots. We were idiots. V okay. Very naive. Okay. Very stupidly using words like openness and... Uh, democracy will be evolved by, I mean, this is really showing up now as to how problematic I think that thinking was. Um, that Why it, was it problematic? Because the, it didn't take into consideration that the imbalance of power that pre-existed. So a lot of internet has just accelerating already problematic structures. I would say when it comes to social media, they are designed as extractive industries. They don't exist unless the users participate and input the information, right? And so as they, they don't actually generate anything themselves. They require you, us, to feed, feed mm -hmm. them. They're the ones that have made Facebook and Twitter worth billions of dollars. Right. And what have they done? to help us accept, undermine Western democracy. So when we talk about young people being connected and being active, we are talking about the privilege uh, in the West. So something that is very important is to what kind of internet, to what kind of connection uh, we are connecting them. And we are, so the West already had all the benefits of the creative web, of the creative internet, built empires, and now these empires go to these regions highly populated by young people, really excited to be part of this conversation, and they just get connected to an extractive um, uh, form. This is yet another form of exploitation. Okay. And, and there's no safeguards. Uh, the big tech companies took advantage of our principles okay. and hijacked them. So, not counting abstinence, what are some strategies that you guys employ or you would recommend to help actually return to kind of this like engagement that you're talking about before um, that isn't just get off social media or stop using your phone so much. But could I ask you? There's Ramona. so much that's packed in on this, right? We're right. talking about the, um, the corrosion of our political sphere at the same time as we're talking about our attention spans and to deal with every, there's so much nuance and it's like talking about the entire planet and every issue that exists on the planet in 75 minutes. Yeah. One thing I want to say too, you know, a lot of this discussion seems to be ignoring the fact that for certain people, Social media is a luxury and a, and a fun time, 
For other members of the population, it's survival, it's your career. Right. And so for those people, that. they are the ones who suffer the most from the downfalls of social media, and they're the ones who depend on it the most. And so when we talk about, is it too much, is it too little, there are forces actively working to force us off of social media. And so ah. that's the one avenue we have. Right. And we would rather have a discussion of when does this ever get to reflect the people who actually depend on social media and not mm -hmm. honestly give the most to social media in this day and age because for those of us who would not have a voice anywhere without it, we're also the ones where the platforms themselves are working to make sure that our voices are quieter hmm. and stifled and less political. And a lot of the discussion ends up being, oh, when I'm free, for, you know, when I'm free, I'm, instead of watching you know, TV, I'm online. Okay, cool, but for a lot of us who <laughs> can't talk about what's happening in the world, we can't talk about how our lives are being endangered without social media, we have a completely different set of problems, which is how can we continue to stay on these platforms when we're being shut down, we're being banned, you know, we're being, all of right. those things are happening to us left and right. Structure. So then if you have such a positive experience online, you have a great platform, how can you be an ally online? So that would be my kind of tip to you. If you're looking for tips around how to survive, actually, how can you use your privilege that you've got online because you have such a great platform and great experience to make sure that other women, other people of color can have that same experience too? This day and age, you have to stay connected, you have to stay online to find out what's happening in the world around you. And uh, in an ideal world, it'll be a great channel for public discourse that you get to hear from all sides and then you exchange ideas and then you come to a conclusion. But then you bring the other trolls and propagandists to the mix and it's a mess out there. Mm -hmm. So for the people who run these, uh, <clears throat> who actually indulge in these conversations and, uh, and these campaigns, how do you filter out the negativity? We are trying to fix uh, the experience with inside a failed architecture that is exploitative. Mm. Mm. Why don't we kill it? Um, I feel like there's been a lot of commentary that's talking about young people's consumption. But I think we also have to acknowledge and understand a bit better that young people are also producing online and we're making a lot of value judgments on versus co consumption versus production and what is a valuable thing in society there. And you have to acknowledge that young people are consuming because that's what corporations run by people much older than them um, you know, who are looking to, to make money off of their data have asked them to do. But young people are using technology and especially using social media sometimes in very subversive ways. They're reappropriating Instagram accounts to find people and educate them about different um, uh, different types of politics through flop accounts. Like this is something that's happening with teenagers and we're not appreciating, and especially I think as parents and mentors in their life, when we're saying, you know, you're on social media, you're doing this, that they're actually educating themselves, they're subverting themselves and they're connecting with this wider community. Is basically we are um, organizing the next revolution in a shopping mall with cameras on monitoring us all the time. So, yeah. That's, that's my reflection. That's why I think that we need to act now and bring our revolution to a space we can control, where they cannot get in. The colonial nation states had come to all of us 20 years ago and said, we would love you to wear a GPS locator with a <laughs> microphone and camera in it around your neck all the time. Please we all would you. have said, you're nuts. <laughs> and instead, we all do it voluntarily. You know, this conversation up here gets better the more we have diversity of voices that are in the conversation. And I think generationally that's really important as well. And if I have any hope, I do think it is uh, the next generation. And it, but I think it requires these kinds of conversations. Of the audience again. I that's think one of the, the larger challenges facing Western democracy is that most of them have ceded power to corporations. Okay. And there's very little we can do as voters in these systems to actually affect change in corporations that have larger GDPs than the countries that we're voting in. So it's hard, like what ballot am I casting mm -hmm. to actually rein in any of this, the capitalism? And the reality is there is none. Democracy has failed us so dramatically. And we are in a moment where we do really have to decide is, is democracy a thing? Or are we just living in a corporate capitalist nation state and globe where ultimately the extraction means mm -hmm. We can't cease to exist. We will have to cease to exist in order to feed the profits of others. And I do think we are at a point where these are very real decisions we should be making. And the media is just a part of how we spread that message. But also, it is 
symptomatic of the larger problems we are facing. Well, the solution is discuss discussing the gap between online and offline, which we didn't do that much. Um, offline, you know, there's like these systems that don't work because they're not incorporating everything. Online, I feel like, based on you know my experience, what I've, I'm studying math right now, um, I see that the, the linkage between like these complicated things, these systems, these people, um, you know, like intersectionality, like people of color, people talking to each other, people, you know, um, having more conversations. Like people are more open to asking me why I wear the hijab online more than on offline. Mm -hmm. Why? I feel like we need to discuss that more. I feel like we need to bring it back offline. The, the stuff that's good online, we need to bring it back, not the other way around. I don't think that we need to dial it back um, online because I think that's not realistic. I don't think that's going to happen. Okay. So I feel like even discussing that is kind of just, that's, that's where the gap is. Solutions. The only thing that I would challenge in what you're saying is I think a lot about agency and I completely reject the notion that this future is just happening to us and that it's there, I, we make these things. And I don't want us to lose that agency, that thing. We have hundreds of different versions of the future. And I feel like we're all just kind of like, well, you got to get with it because here it is, or we can't change it. Because the incentive now is data extractivism that goes to just five companies. We need to take it back on our benefit and create the, the platforms for collective action and mm -hmm. for uh, personal growth. That's the fight that we have now, and I think that that's the challenge. We need to bring it back to the commons, and it, it is a commons, it's a new commons, a digital commons, and that's, uh, the, that's the real fight. And that's the fight that will enable us to fight the other fight on the physical and on, uh, against capitalism and, uh, and, uh, and to save the planet, basically. Maybe that's, you know, maybe we can just approach all of this with a different philosophy, which is fix things, take our time, reflect, and have conversations. All right. Maybe we could end with everybody giving us just what's your best pragmatic advice to keep moving forward while we hope for better tools? History, history has been dominated by white men. Well, unfortunately, all these platforms have been designed by them as well. That's who's in Silicon Valley making all these things. So I think we need the people making the tools that we use for all aspects of our lives to be uh, more diverse. It will sound paradox, but learn from the, those offline from the past, learn, learn from the old revolutionaries in your country, learn from the old social movements, and learn tactics, how they used to uh, disguise and hide and so and update it to digital. I, th uh, I think asynchronous communication is underrated. Asynchronous? Yeah. Could you, I don't think I know the word. Because if you get stuff, you don't have to respond to it right away. Just define when you use them and it helps you be more thoughtful when you're doing so. That's an option. Asynchronous communication. It's great. We're putting a lot of trust in things that are very temporary. And I think it would be better to go back to some of the more grounded wisdom around how we actually live together on this planet um, that is offline wisdom uh, and should be sought there and probably kept there, to be honest. And, um, and I can't help but think if our governments, if our companies had a little bit more um, indigenous or First Nations philosophies embedded, they might behave better in the grander world. Join me in thanking Bianca, Jesse, Ramona, and Lefort.